Can anybody online hear us okay? <laughs> Yes. Mm. Just testing the audio and I see Regent Johnson just joined us. Regent Johnson, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Good morning. Great. Good morning. Thank you. I'm just going to go ahead and leave the mute off. Okay. Thank you. You're so anxious for quiet. Yeah. <laughs> like you're icing the shooter here, but. <laughs> Just relax. We'll start in about three minutes. I told you I got to do color once for a Kelly County game, didn't I? Yeah. 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 It was fun. So, did you overanalyze the offensive linemen since that was your position? Well, this was basketball. Oh, basketball. So, okay. So, no, I didn't overanalyze it. <laughs> to the actual dashboard. Just, just share the PowerPoint. I'll reference and remind folks. Thank you. Well, I don't know. Maybe it would be helpful for you to remind people how to get to yeah. oh, okay. Do do yep. OK, thanks. Yeah, thanks. I can put it in the chat. I'm okay. put it in the chat. And then we'll share the PowerPoint. I'll put the link in the chat. Dream work. Makes the dream work. Well, good morning, everyone. I have 1030, and so let's begin our meeting. I want to welcome all of you to our first face-to-face -face BASC meeting for the academic year. Excited to have you here, excited to be in person with you. I just, just want to make a comment that uh, <coughs> September 20th has significance uh, for a former educator and a current educator in K-12. So if you see Regent Mendoza and I looking around and counting you, it's because September 20th is count day. And so uh, um, you may be thinking about that. But glad you're here. Um, excited about our agenda. We have a very full day and uh, hope we have some robust conversations. Just some reminders, uh, please state your name before speaking so that those that are listening with us online know who you are. To those not on the committee, please uh, keep your cameras off and your microphones muted. 
uh, members, you may choose to be uh, recognized uh, by myself if you want to comment, but I'm also very comfortable if you just jump in and have questions or, or want to engage. Uh, don't feel like you have to wait for recognition. Uh, Amy's going to monitor the Zoom chat and the raise your hand feature uh, so that if there are any questions or comments that we can address those. And um, we're being live streamed, so you can find this on KBOR's YouTube channel. So, Amy, if you take a moment to please call the roll. <clears throat> Thank you. Good morning. <clears throat> we have Regent Lane. Present. Regent Mendoza. Present. Regent Ice. I'm present. Regent Johnston. Here. Thank you. And then we do have the presenters today. We have Daniel Archer. Here. And that completes roll call. Thank you very much. Also want to welcome our student advisory members here and ask them to introduce themselves, please. And uh, look where they all are seated up front. <laughs> so I'd like to begin. Hi guys, I'm Jamie Parnell. I'm the president of the Student Government Association at Pittsburgh State University. Hi everyone, my name is Hannah Eckstein and I'm the vice president of the Student Government Association at Pittsburgh State. We're so excited to be here today. Hi everyone, I'm Ella Burrows and I'm the student body president at Fort Hayes State University. Really glad you're here and your voices are important. So today or at any future meeting, feel free to join us at the table if you want please. So thanks, thanks for being here. Uh, so I think we're ready for approval of minutes. I have the check group. We have a motion to approve by Regent Mendoza. Is there a second? A second. All those in favor? Hi. Hi. Regent Johnston. Thank you. Thank you very much. Regent Johnston, do you want to share with folks where you are on your adventure today? Well, thank you. Yeah, I'm in Juneau, Alaska. It's beautiful up here. Three hour difference in time. So that's, you know, tested my ability to be able to get here, you know, and know that I'm at the right time. But yeah, it's been gorgeous weather. Did a little whale watching yesterday and saw some humpbacks. So yeah, very nice. Okay. We're glad to so be much. here too. Thank you for making the effort to, to join us. Your voice is important. Um, before we start the agenda, since there, this is our first meeting, if we could go around the room and everybody just introduce yourself quickly, that way all of us, including our students, will know who's, who's in the room. We'll start with you, Tara. Okay. Uh, Tara Labar, Associate Director of Academic Affairs uh, here on KBOR staff. Sam Christy Dangermond, a Director for Academic Affairs here at KBOR. I'm Jill Arnstorff. I serve as the provost and vice president for academic affairs at Port Hayes State University. Hi, I'm Shirley Lefever. I'm the executive vice president and provost at Wichita State. Howard Smith, executive vice president and provost at Pittsburgh State. Barb Lamar, I serve as provost and executive vice chancellor for the university campus. Heather Morgan, the executive director of the Kansas Community College Association. <clears throat> Amy Robinson, and I'm the executive assistant to the academic affairs at KBOR. Thank you, Amy. Uh, Gage Rolf, I'm Associate General Counsel here at the Board of Regents. Kelly Oliver, um, Board of Regents staff, uh, Senior Director of Strategic Initiatives. Norm Phillip, President elect, Faculty Senate at Pittsburgh State University. Rebecca Book, uh, Faculty Senate President at Pittsburgh State University. Brandon Galm, Interim Vice President for Academic Affairs, Cloud County Community College. Joe Dowling, Faculty Senate President, at Wichita State University. Arlen Liker, trustee at Kobe Community College, current president of KACC. Gorbachan Singh, vice president of academic affairs at Johnson County Community College. I'm Don Von Bergen with Kansas State University. I'm this year's chair of the Council of Faculty Senate Presidents. Tanya Gonzalez, I am the interim associate provost for at Kansas State University. Tom Neville, vice president of academics at Butler Community College. Luke Dale, Vice President of Academic Affairs at Sir County Community College. Mark Malone, Vice President for Instructional Services at Garden City Community College. Thank you all very much. Your voices are important to the work we do here. So really appreciate you <coughs> taking time to attend. Um, so we'll move now into our uh, agenda items and uh, point of chair privilege, if I may. I wanted to thank uh, Provost Tabor and, and all the provosts of submitting your feedback on the draft board goals that are under consideration. Wanted to just take a minute to ask members uh, if there are any questions based on the feedback or a provost if there's any additional clarification that you'd like to provide. So first, questions from regents on the feedback we received. 
comments. Oh, seeing none, okay. I don't know if um, Provost Tabor is online with us. Is he, Amy? He actually should be here. He should be here. Uh, he's probably <coughs> in college. Oh, okay. All okay. right. Um, well, we will miss his feedback, but any additional comments from Provost on the goals? I don't think there are any additional comments. I do think there were some questions we had in there. We look forward to having in terms of clarification over time about how particular work could be done. Okay, very good. Well, thank you for taking the time to do that. I think that was important and appreciate Provost Onstorf for suggesting that you have an opportunity to reflect on the goals. So, all right, um, with that, let's move into our um, I, other items, uh, other matters for discussion. Uh, Amy, if you would put up, please, uh, the PowerPoint on a quick update on where we are with, with the dashboard. And I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly. If you go to the uh, next slide, please. As you recall, we began the development of a dashboard on pillar one to make sure that we had a high focus on uh, our students and student success and helping Kansas families. The dashboard is comprised of foundational metrics, which really are lagging our annual measures. Uh, the board approved those indicators uh, last year, and we're now in the process of working through our support metrics. I've asked Amy and she's put in the chat or we'll put in the chat the link to the actual dashboard. It is live on the KBOR website with the foundational indicators and you can find that on the, the homepage and, and, and get right to those. Uh, next slide, please. As a reminder of um, the metrics, they are based in these three areas of affordability, access, and success, sometimes referred to as completion. Next slide. The foundational metrics for affordability are on the screen. You can see them there. Next slide. Then we have uh, identified foundational or lagging indicators for access. That are there, and then one more slide, please, Amy. Uh, and then the success indicator. So those are all uh, data points that we already collect that are the annual uh, indicators of looking at those. So where we are next, uh, next slide please, is, is vetting through support metrics. Now these metrics are short-term. They're leading indicators. They're the kinds of metrics that should be actionable for us so we can understand what are we doing in our actions to, to promote um, affordability and access and success. And so there is a small subcommittee made up of two university CEOs and there were two board members and we vetted through ideas on what the support metrics might be. So I wanted to just share where we are with that process so far. So support metrics for FAFSA completion, uh, is, is one of those. We are in debate about whether or not that's useful as a leading indicator or whether or not that really should move to foundational. So that one has some work uh, to do. The next one is on pace to completion and we'll be looking both at full-time and part-time students for that. And then on pace in the fall census. Uh, the last one, and all of those are areas that we already collect data on. The next one is an area that I'm, we're waiting on confirmation from our data team on uh, what's our status on co-requisite versus developmental ed. So that may be a new one, but we'll be examining how students are doing in those two models. Next slide, Amy. Under access, we're looking at transfer students by program. We already look at transfer student success overall. This will actually take it down to the program level. And then high school students enrolled in post-secondary courses. Who has access? Where, where do we have gaps? Under the success metrics, uh, we want to be uh, delving in to uh, pass rates, DFWs uh, by student, by program, and by course. And um, We'll be looking at withdrawals for that, and we'll be looking at the number of students who are flagged in our early alert systems. Now I'm saying we will be looking at, BASC needs to approve these indicators and we need feedback from you all on whether or not uh, we're on track with those. And then the final area of student success, this is all about our professional advising 
recognizing that not all of our systems are currently up and running in terms of tracking professional advising, but want to begin talking about the kinds of things that we'll look at under those categories of number of contacts that we have with students, the types of appointments students are having with advisors, and um, looking at actual uh, overall uh, data um, that the advisors are utilizing, academic, financial, and support structures. So the idea behind support was to have fewer indicators that are more actionable, uh, leading to the success of moving the needle on our lagging indicators. So any questions about where we are in the process? Any wonderings about any of the indicators that I've quickly gone through? And members, you have a copy of this PowerPoint at your, at your place for further consideration. We sound like we're on the right path or is there something that's not matching with what you were hoping for? Seems like the right path to me. Regent Johnson, anything you wanna add or ask about? No, I agree. I think it's the right path. I think we just need to delve into some of the support measures and see how, you know, what, what we need to do to either shore those up or look in a different direction. But I think we're certainly on the right path. Thank you very much. The slide that's on the screen now is just an area of, of some consideration. There's been some uh, conversation about whether or not we should be looking at our average wage as compared to tuition in Kansas. This likely is not a support metric, might be a lagging indicator, but um, we need to refine what we mean by that and how that might be useful in terms of the board uh, understanding decisions around tuition and fees versus the income level of our so that, that's a new one. So next steps. Um, yes. I'm sorry. No, please. I could ask on that. Um, it would certainly be good data to see because the range there may be so great. Um, I would ask you to consider that it might be not only average, but that you do look at that, what the ranges are, or medians and, and modes as well. All right. Um, in that kind of data, because I think the average um, may confuse as much as clarify. Great point. Thank you for that. Carlos. Okay, next step. Very possible the report we get this afternoon could be helpful with this. As it well. might, right. And I think I mean, because of that upcoming report, that's where um, this, uh, this thought's coming from. And, and I. Not sure. Oh, please go ahead. Um, I noticed they said Kansas wages, and I, I know we're sensitive to that, but we do have to, especially if we think about the report today, we might need to think about other comparisons also. This is really a, just a, a draft concept that may be important, so we'll learn more. Next steps. Um, we, we are in the process of trying to finalize the support metrics. Two things that are under consideration. Are they the right metrics? The other one is, what do we already collect? And then kind of a third um, concept on the table is how will the EAB navigate system allow us to have this data on a, a as near to real time basis as possible. So we still have a lot to work through. I'm hoping that we can bring the indicators or the metrics themselves to you all at our November meeting for approval. Uh, Chair Rolf has said that BASC needs to take the lead on improving the support metrics. So we appreciate that and then begin to have robust discussions around the support metrics in December for those that we already collect the data on. There'll be some that we'll need to wait on um, adding to the dashboard. Provost, I uh, will be asking for uh, a meeting to discuss how we might engage in effective reporting and discussion of the support metrics. I'm thinking about uh, asking each of you to have a three to five minute overview of what your data say, what are the actions you're taking to improve your data on a regular basis. But we need to talk through what does that look like? Um, how do we make it uh, beneficial to your time and to our understanding? So look, look for an opportunity to have more discussion about that. Okay. So that's where we are. It's been a huge project, very thankful to our data team and Cindy Ferrier in particular for, for leadership on that. You know, um, it's one thing to call out a 
metric. It's another thing to define it, make sure we're all collecting it in the same way and that it's useful. And um, I think we've come a long way and, and look forward to getting towards being able to actually implement the support metrics. Yes. 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 Sure can. Do you want to uh, handle that for me, Amy? All right, um, I think now we're ready to hear from Dr. Archer. Uh, the first item is an update on our program review. Set up here. It's kind of nice to be able to see my Zoom stuff in real time. You know, everyone can actually see it because those of you all that were on the map pathway, you know, we had a little journey there the other day. Okay, so just kind of revisiting this here, we had talked about um, exempting mission critical programs from this review. Obviously, that was something we talked about in May and, uh, or June, rather. And ultimately, though, in subsequent discussions and feedback that we've had, I think it, it really created more confusion um, than it provided clarity. So that's not going to be in the process going forward here. Um, so we are really going to move forward with the core um, review here. So that's going to be our focus going forward here is, is again, the core review. Um, so all undergraduate programs will go through this framework here. And so there's four criteria, student demand, degree production, talent pipeline, and the student return on investment. So if a program does not meet, again, two or more of the criteria, it would be a flag for review. Um, and in terms of the timing on this, because obviously we're making a little bit of adjustment now, taking the mission critical piece out of it here, uh, we're looking to codify the programs uh, on October 19th through 20th. And um, there's a campus visit at KU. We normally do not have BAS meetings at that type of meeting, but we are going to make a, a special meeting just for this. Um, and so we'll be working with KU because usually we have the campus visits, the, the host campus really sets the schedule up so we want to be sensitive to that but work with them so we'll probably be reaching out to some folks at KU here in the next couple of days and hopefully getting this meeting set uh, and obviously we'll communicate that to people but we're looking at um, October 19th or 20th for a special BAS meeting there uh, in terms of there that's just really a, a starting point um, there's a six-month period thereafter from October going to April where institutions will be able to conduct their reviews get feedback involve stakeholders. Um, so there's a six month, there's ample time, obviously, to conduct reviews. Um, and then fast forward to May, BASC will review those recommendations and, and advise the board. Ultimately, the board will make the final decision in June. So just to reiterate, um, this is a process. Um, there'll be time for feedback on the campuses. There won't be any decisions made until June of 2024. So we're pretty far out, but the process would um, really start here at that October 19th um, or 20th meeting that we're gonna be setting here. Um, you know, with this process here, I think Regent Lane and I have talked about this a little bit here. I think one of the big things that, you know, we probably wanna talk about and kind of plan for a little bit is just, just some of the timelines associated with some of these actions. Um, just as an example, if, if a program was gonna be merged um, obviously, I know it kind of varies on the circumstances and, and the, the, the issues, um, but what would be kind of a proactive timeline based on the realities on your campuses, if you can kind of think about that? Does anyone have any thoughts on timelines here when you, if, you, if there is a merger or another example would be a program is put on an action plan, what's a reasonable time to have an action plan if the enrollment's maybe low to get the enrollment up? I mean, we're just trying to think of when would follow be appropriate and what would give you enough time to do that, but also be very proactive. So this is open for, for some discussion. Um, in our policy, it does not um, have timelines for action plan, merger, or um, uh, teach out. So we want your input. What should that look like? What do you all need to consider when deciding which avenue to take? And certainly, uh, regents jump in with questions you have as well. Okay. Provost. The merger, 
I think you, you mentioned that it's kind of case or situational specific. I, uh, most of the time, at least when we make a, a recommendation to merge, we have a contract. We, we know when that would happen. And I can't say that they're all the same. Right, right. right. That's fair. So I, I, at the point that recommendation would come forward, I think we can present a timeline. But most, in most cases, that happens within about uh, a semester or, or so. I mean, that's now again, I'm not speaking for everybody else here. This on the uh, on the phase out. That's and that's always always a calendar. I mean, we, we one it's going to be dependent upon the number of majors yeah. or the number of students in those pipelines. So in some cases that that could be very quickly. Yeah. In some cases cases that might be upwards of two years. Uh, getting nods here, so I'm, yeah, because I would have thought it could potentially be four, depending on okay. yeah. That's just so I, think, bit, yeah. I think we can. Probably at the point where that decision is is uh, presented in advance, okay. the timeline ought to come with it. But okay. it would probably be in those kind of in that kind of framework. That's what I'm thinking. I, I have a similar response, and I might not get your words exactly right, Regent Lane. But on the one hand, so first of all, is what's the plan? Is she saying? Um, and I think the the plan for what the actions would be. Is probably the first thing in its relatively short order, and it may even be part of our response to say, if, for example, we are recommending a merger, these would be the steps we would take, and we would even identify that in that time. Um, a merger at the University of Kansas requires a review by our faculty senate, um, so we have we have a process that we go through um, to just to make sure we get everything clear, and then there is the to teach out or the phase out of a program, which depending on the program, I would say you're probably imagining four years for the teach out and it could potentially be less, but but likely that's what it's gonna be. So that, that nebulous period is the time to get approvals and everything sort of squared away internally. But I would say between a semester and a year is part of that process, no more than an academic year. Um, a semester possibly so long story short based on that i'd say by the end of this academic year we would know what our plan is next academic year at least in the first semester we would we would run the approval to kick everything <coughs> so so i'd say the longest in merger phase out like a four-year time In terms of the action plan, um, what I was thinking, we do have programs in Fort Hayes that would go on an action plan. I would say that probably have benchmarks yearly that would be and then a total of two or three years. <coughs> in terms of the number one action for you, um, that's what I'm trying to think through as well. So if it's a really comprehensive action plan, that's going to take a little bit longer. And so I would think that maybe when you said when we submit our action plan, the timeline could be incorporated into that. And, and if I, I don't know. So so one is talk about the merger phase out of the program. <clears throat> Second is a program's low enrolled, but it should be better than what right. you do about that. The only things that I would add in terms of the conversation around the points that Jill and Shirley made is I would imagine in my mind um, a general scenario would be an action plan is first there's probably two things going on. One is we just haven't recruited and advertised well for that. And so really kind of have to think about that time frame on the recruitment cycle. So we can have an action plan that we're going to recruit better. There is kind of a, a generic point in time where you're bringing students into a program. It also kind of depends on if it's an undergrad or grad level program that you're thinking about when you go out and you recruit students in and when you see the payback on that coming. So, so to really see if an action plan works on recruitment, it's probably going to take you about 18 months, I think, to, to demonstrate that you've got more students in the pipeline. Um, the other part that that I think comes to play for an action plan is part of the living um, the living nature of curriculum 
and it and so I'm trying to think of something off the top of my head to give examples. Let's just say it's programs that have done statistics things before and now it's moving to analytics. And, and part of that um, important role is to make sure your curriculum is updated so it's attractive, that students understand why they want to enroll in it and workforce understands why it would be beneficial to have students in it. That might require another, you know, I'll, I'll just say a year or so of conversation. So I'm kind of totally guessing that they, faculty colleagues, am I, am I sounding kind of right in terms of give yourself a year to get the curriculum refreshed? In that same time, you can be recruiting to that, but it's probably 18 to 24 more months, or, or 24 months, we're gonna see a, a year and a half to two years to get the curriculum updated and get students recruited in it. But I generally say it depends on the complexity, again, of how many things you have to do. It's refreshing the curriculum and it's recruiting students. And, and recruiting student, students is just the thing that takes the longest amount of time because you're on a recruiting cycle. It, it, it almost should align with actually um, when we ask for a new program because in that we always we always project three years of enrollment and there's a reason why we ask for that program and there's a there's a market study about the demand and it's almost going back to why the program was initiated to begin with and because if it's not making then our first analogy is off uh, in the sense that it should have made if in fact the data were and the information we presented were accurate at that point but it could have been a time and place and now time and place may be a little different so um, I, I, again I, I go back to i think um, to me it's about three it's anywhere from a semester to three to four years probably but uh, you, you need to go back and look at your trend analysis too uh, one of the things that this shouldn't be a surprise to anybody if your enrollments are dropping then, you know, you, if you've waited three years to deal with it, why'd you wait three years? <coughs> I mean, come on. Uh, so I think it's, uh, I think part of that, going back to kind of the plan that we put it in play, I'll be, be, be distant. I think I want to elaborate just a little bit on what, um, when we say curriculum refresh, um, that, so depending on the state of the program, that could be, starting with conversations with stakeholders, right? So in that process of gathering feedback from stakeholders can be pretty time consuming. Um, there's so many factors that can play into it. Maybe it's a licensure program and licensure uh, changes that come, to, uh, come forward that the program has to address. So it's, that sounds like an easy question to ask. How long does it take to redo a program? But there's so many factors that come into play. I think it's a little bit challenging to do a But again, I'll kind of take back on your there might be a program that we decide to can that we may recommend to continue anyway. I'll give you an example right now on our area. We don't have enough med techs. And, and I mean and it's a it's a safety issue. So the sheer fact that that's going to cost. Uh, I think most people want, if they're in a car accident, would like someone to come up with, uh, to, you know, to help them. So that might be something that would also be then in the analysis as to why it's continued. And so I don't think it's just because we have a, a date at the end that necessarily goes away either. If, the, if whatever need is there. Awful comment. Any questions from the regions? Was. I guess I'd just go back if that's not comforting to you at all, um, because there's a lot of it depends on all these variables. I do think the most important thing is in any of those scenarios, whether they're cash and plan, emergent program, or paid out of program, we ought to be able to tell you exactly what the steps are for what we're doing in that time frame that we have right there that you can agree to or challenge us on if it doesn't seem right. Because because I think it's articulating the steps that we're going to take in any one of those three scenarios. And it's knowing that's the plan we're going to be taking. Yeah, I appreciate that. It's the nuances that, that uh, we need to hear from you all in order to make wise, informed decisions, right? So uh, the conversation has been very uh, helpful for me. I'm also wondering if the provost want to uh, 
not standardized formats for these, but tell us what we should be looking for in each of these separate actions. What should an action plan contain? What should a merger plan contain? And what does the phase out plan need to contain? Uh, if you'd be willing to do that, I think that would be most, most helpful so that we are knowing that we're seeing standard information from each institution uh, in, in these areas. Anything else, uh, Regents, that you think, or Dr. Archer, that might be helpful? Oh, this was helpful for me, so I appreciate you all opening up. So just to be clear on that last, it's um, a request that we help provide what I would say a template document that you would give to us in a scenario to say, fill this out so you so we have consistent information we're sharing on what an action plan would include. We have consistent information we're sharing on what a process would be for murder and a consistent information document we're sharing on what phase out would include. Now, if you all want a template document, that I will leave to you. If you want to use the same document, what, what I'm asking for is that we're looking at the same information. Okay. Thank you. That's helpful. And it may have the added benefit if we could we look for what you not, naturally do. That's mm -hmm. always helpful if that happy circumstance occurs. Anything else on this topic, Dr. Archer? Any other questions that you have in general? Yes. I do have a question. So um, at BASC at the October meeting, we'll be codifying programs for review. We'll still that we would each receive our respective lists prior to that um, versus them being made public with the agenda a couple of days prior to October 19th. We'll find a way that's not surprising to provost what's on the list. Okay. Because you need to be prepared immediately to talk to your constituents, your faculty, your As students. You can imagine, right. People are very anxious about. It. So when you're when you're thinking about that, uh, what kind of time frame would you like to have? Recognizing that that we want to try to control. This is a significant impact for our students, our families, and those that are involved in these programs. We realize that we, we want to have be thoughtful, and we also don't want to get information out in front of the process that we're using and the thoughtfulness of it. So, a week before, would that be your preference? Uh, I believe when we talked um, the last last meeting, I think it was we talked about maybe October one um, ahead of that. That date being a target, I don't know if that's so possible, but yeah, as, as much lead time as possible. possible. Yeah. But I would say for me, at the minimum, a week would be helpful. And anything you can do beyond that week can just make it a little less rough. Mm -hmm. uh, and let me also just say that, that this is not designed to take a uh, heavy swipe through our programs. This is designed based on the feedback that you all be thoughtful about uh, the programs that are in demand and those that we may be continuing to offer that just aren't. So uh, but we're mindful that this impacts people and we need to be sensitive to that and be thoughtful about next step decisions. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Archer. Um, I think we're now ready for a general update. Uh, yeah, so I thought I'd just take this time here to kind of give you an overview of some of the large projects that we're going to be working on. I apologize, it's not as big as it should be, but um, try to articulate this verbally here. Some of these may be a little bit shorter or longer. It kind of depends. Obviously, this is an estimate here, but there's really seven big projects that we're going to be focusing on this year. Uh, the first one is Math Pathways. I think most everyone's um, aware of that. It's based on aligning specific courses with specific majors and really trying to get away from the idea of most students taking college algebra when it's not really relevant, those skills aren't relevant for the majority of majors, as an example. Um, social science majors, so political science majors, psychology majors, sociology majors, criminal justice, they're going to gain far more by taking a SATS course than they would college algebra. Those skills are far more pertinent um, than the college algebra skills. Um, we're talking about stat skills versus college algebra. So um, we're going to be continuing to meet with disciplines in our system. Um, working on that alignment. So education is an example. We're going to meet with some of the technical um, associate degree programs because the technical math is appropriate for them in a lot of cases, but there may be another option. So we want to certainly hear them out as well. And, and, and K-State's got some unique programs being a land grant institution um, that they only offer, but obviously there's transfer students and we want to make sure everyone's on the same page. So we'll be meeting with them and 
um, wrapping that work up by the end of this year, hopefully more in like early 2024 um, and talking calendar year as opposed to June, but um, we, we went and mapped it out for the whole year in the event that more time is needed. Um, another big piece that we're going to be tackling in the near future is system-wide course placement standards. And I've used this as a framing device. A common question that we get from high school counselors is what is required to enroll in college algebra? And the answer to that is, is we don't know because there's up to 32 different standards. We're really one of the only states in the entire country that doesn't have a state standard for a class like college algebra. And so really what we're trying to do is bring people together, um, bring math faculty together, English faculty together, and really come up with some requisite standards. You know, this is the ACT score you need to enroll in college algebra or one brother math, or this is the SAT score. This is some sort of high school performance standard, a GPA, or maybe grades in certain high school courses. And that way that puts us in a position, I think, to work more collaboratively with our K-12 counterpart, the Kansas State Department of Education, and having some really clear college readiness standards that apply across the board. So I think this will be really meaningful and impactful um, so we'll be engaging in that work here in the near future. Um, another piece that we're kind of reopening is reverse transfer. And I think this is something that people have heard, but just as a refresher, this is based on kind of universities identifying incoming transfer students who have earned a high volume of uh, transfer credit hours from a community college. And so the idea is you identify those students, again, who have a lot of community college credit hours and you work with the student and you work with the community college on helping that student earn an associate's degree from the community college where they earned a lot of hours. And there are some cases where the student already qualifies for the associate degree. There are cases where a student has 60 or 70 hours from a community college and it's just a matter of double checking and then awarding the degree. So sometimes it's easy. Sometimes though it's a matter of they need one or two classes or maybe three or four classes to complete that associate degree and then they can take the class at the university because they're already enrolled there and then transfer them back. That's where the whole reverse transfer idea terminology kind of comes into play. Um, and so uh, this is something that we've done as a system the last five or six years. I think some have, have probably done it better than others, like a lot of things. And so I think it's something that we've done okay on, we could probably do better. Um, and so we are gonna be reconvening and, and we've got a group and they're gonna be meet, meeting on October the 2nd. And so we've done some homework here just over the summer. Uh, we've talked to Complete College America and got some ideas from them on some best practices. We also had a really um, I think good meeting with the Registrar at the University of Arizona. They serve a ton of transfer students. Um, and so they've got a really good system. Their Registrar was a Registrar at a large community college system in Chicago. So he really sees it from both angles. He was extremely helpful and shared some really good insights and lessons of what they had learned. Um, and so we're really trying to collect best practices. We're going to talk to Colorado, um, our neighbor here. They've done some good work in this space and then bring that back to the group, obviously get feedback from the group, have them share ideas. And then hopefully together we'll collectively be able to, to implement some best practices to, to kind of move the needle and, and get these numbers up. Um, so that's going to be a big piece here. Obviously, program review. Um, is significant. We touched on that. Obviously, we're going to be codifying the programs and then the institutions will be conducting their reviews and then BASC will pick this up uh, later on in May and the board in, in uh, June. Um, general education implementation obviously continues. Um, you know, one of the significant kind of core ideas of having a general education package is that if someone completes the general education at one institution, it transfers and plugs in and applies toward completing general education at the receiving institution, kind of this idea of block transfer. Uh, we want that as much as possible. However, we uh, acknowledge there's, there's unique programs and there's programmatic accreditation, there's licensure with engineering programs, education programs, and there's gonna have to be some exceptions to that. And we've got a process that and institutions have submitted those. We're reviewing those right now. We should have those done by October 1st and the latest maybe the, the end of the first week of October, uh, but we're working on those. Um, and then um, just kind of moving forward into another element, I think it's gonna be discussed today, gets into nursing alignment. And this really stems from last year and some recommendations that were made um, uh, Vice President Scott Smathers at the board office who oversees the workforce development division in our shop here. He worked with a nursing advisory committee. Um, he was comprised of nursing deans and um, some professional healthcare association members. I think we had the dean of nursing from KU in Pittsburgh State. We had some community college deans or nursing directors on there as well. And one of their um, recommendations was to align nursing prerequisite courses throughout the system. 
So just as an example, um, there are some nursing programs that require statistics. There's some that don't. There's some that require chemistry. There's some that don't. And so I think the challenge that creates for students sometimes is when they uh, they complete that RN degree at a community college or a technical college, and then they want to continue on and uh, get a baccalaureate degree. Sometimes there's some added time to degree and some things that come up that create some challenges and issues. Um, and so we want to uh, try to see if we can build some alignment there. Obviously, it's a it's a huge hurdle, but I think it's it's doable. Uh, but that's going to be a big project uh, this year. And then lastly is something we probably haven't talked about because it happened at the very tail end of the legislative session last year was there's a new adult scholarship program um, uh, that will be for students who are 25 or older. And it's designed for low to middle income uh, earners or families. Um, it's for uh, baccalaureate programs only um, in high need areas. So like information technology, cybersecurity, nursing, education, those kinds of things here. And so one of the things that's going to be on us in terms of board staff and academic affairs specifically is to outline a process for approving those programs that would be eligible. Um, and so uh, we'll be working on that here in the near future because this is something that's open to our institutions. Uh, as well as private institutions and also online um, institutions that specialize in competency education. Um, Western Governors is an example. You've seen the ads, they'll, they'll be uh, tapping into this, but we're going to have to have a process uh, for institutions to submit programs and we'll have to review them and make sure that they fit and then saying okay and kind of moving forward. So we'll be outlining that here in the next several months. Thank you very much, Dr. Archer. I appreciate the Gantt chart. So uh, thanks for that, Tess. Mm -hmm. Just so everyone knows, I've asked Dr. Archer to give us regular updates and timelines so we can all visualize the impact on the work that you're leading uh, with our initiatives here. So let's open it up for any questions or uh, comments to Dr. Archer. Please. I've got one potential suggestion, but I don't know if I really do. And it's on math pathway. And it's really about naming it because when you when you read the performance funding plans and document on that, there's really two pathways I think we're talking about. One is math and one is English um, on that document. And so English kind of gets buried in the work. And I would like to be as transparent as we can be about that. So I thought about, I don't know if it's course pathways or fundamentals pathways. Okay. Um, yeah, that's fair. Yeah. But but I do think it might be helpful to say that. Okay. This is helpful to see this, to think about it as it impacts your work, but you can layer your other work on top of this work, right? Uh, I'd like to talk a minute about nursing alignment. It's not about the nursing alignment, but it's about program to program articulation and our ability to do that um, in a thoughtful but progressive kind of way. And so I'd like some feedback on. Uh, whether or not we should establish a committee that can identify other programs, perhaps maybe the top three or five enrolled programs that we can begin a process of program articulation. So much like we did with elementary ed. Uh, is that the best avenue to go to really keep us moving forward with recognizing that we want our students and families to know when they're complete at one institution, 60 hours, then we get them to 60 hours or 64 for those uh, 124 area, area programs. How do we move forward without just taking one program at a time, I guess is my question. My opinion on that would be, if you're really looking at systemically your structure and, and I only can speak for my institution, not for example. I think some of that's going to come out of reverse transfer, honestly, because it, it's almost you have to look backward to figure out how to move students forward. And once we understand the scope, and I'd really be interested to know what the, the guidance or what suggestions you got from, from Arizona, because it really is the system sometimes that get in the way of making that possible and how automated or not automated they are. Um, so I, I, it might be that that starting point can help us understand what's not working around um, systems communication between four years and two years. Um, and then maybe that informs 
where do we go from there? Because so, and, and that might sound like a weird answer, Regent Lane, because you're asking about which programs do we need to focus on, which I think in many ways is a workforce question. And I would trust that our community college partners might know as well as the four years would what they would really like to see happen there. But I think in all those cases, the hang up is honestly the systems and, and the processes that make it work. So that's, that's just because we can name them, but if we keep having the same systems problems, we're still going to struggle. I appreciate that. I'm not asking today for us to name the programs. I'm really asking us to talk about what's our process for moving it forward. So thank you for that. Start given that we've got community college, technical college, and four year institutions represented in that group, an existing group. And that, that seems like a logical place for that conversation. Want to add, Heather? Yeah, I was going to surface in the room. That my concern with an existing group is that existing group has existing work. And the urgency with which this is going to come at this, our system is going to come across the street in the Capitol. We're starting to hear this legislatively, program to program articulation, 60 hours retaking courses. So I think from the community college system, we could name the programs, but there's got to be some more urgency on moving forward with some pathways, like with elementary ed. Point. So I, I think the challenge here is balancing two different needs. I mean, I think they require different groups. So one is, is the first step, which is identifying where the opportunity Lie. And I agree with Barbara Bicklemeyer that the um, this is as much an issue of uh, you know, analyzing the market and, uh, where workforce needs lie as it is in looking at which programs are highly subscribed. Those pieces of information need to be taken into account in determining the opportunities. But progress is made quickly as it was with the education teams. When you have the right group of experts, disciplinary people, and so that will require a later step that brings together experts in a particular area to actually build the articulation. It's needed, but it's, I think it's, it's a two-step mm -hmm. process, and I don't really see a way to do it without having it really a really a two-step process. Thank you for that. Anything else that you want to add? I was just thinking about the articulation agreements that we already have in place might be a, a good vantage point from which to begin looking for those programs that might fit well into that kind of a, a process. Makes sense as well. Any questions or ideas from the regents? Dr. Archer, perhaps we can talk about this feedback that we've received and think about where it fits on your Gantt chart and how we how we might build maybe on what we learned from reverse transfer, but then also uh, some of these other suggestions. Thank you all for that. Any other um, question or comment on the scope of work that's outlined here? So I are we missing sure. something? Please, Regent. So I'm going to strain that question. So you may very well call me out of order. And if so, please, please, please do that. Uh, and um, program review, I've, I've been troubled since we talked about it, about the question about knowing, quote unquote, the list. So chair slash Regent Lane has said this and is appropriately very concerned. It's a somber topic, right? So we want to make sure we communicate this really, 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 really well. Did I do enough really? Um, <laughs> One or two more might be Okay, <laughs> really, really well. Um, and, and so, so I mean, towards that end, I think we're less interested in making sure we got lists that everybody knows what they are and more that we establish the environment for the work to be done. And, and towards that end, you know, there's some timeline the end, Regents approved. I mean, I think we described utopia as we just nod after you tell us what the answer is. <laughs> At least for my case, I would say that. So, so it seems to me, you all know what the four triggers are. So to some degree, you already know what we're talking about, don't you? Um, and, so, and so I can, at least for me, it would be helpful to hear how you recognize that at some point we're gonna have to reveal something. <laughs> um, 
how you all think that would be helpful to do it so that the, commu the work can be done, the communication can be done in the right appropriate way. It doesn't feel like to me like we give you a list on October 1st or October 8th or whatever it is, but then you can go do something about it. So is that, am I, I'm understandable. I know I'm not, I don't want to ask if I make it sense, but can you please communicate what I'm trying to ask about? Part of it's a checks and balance. I'll speak for myself. Um, we've already gone back four metrics. I already know what they are. I already know some programs that are going to show up. And we, I think we all. I'd be shocked if you didn't. Yeah. And, and honestly, uh, one of the things when we went back to review some of this, some of the same programs showed up on a report we did uh, for a different board five years ago uh, with different purpose, different time, different work on the low enrollment. Some of those, some of those same programs showed up at that point. I see a heads nodding around the room too. So I think there that is there, but we need to know if there's anything new and different. Because one of the things that I think is critical is, at least from my perspective, is I don't need faculty to think that all of a sudden their programs in jeopardy for whatever reason, or the students. Students read those names in the paper, and then they wonder if they get if they're going to finish their uh, their program. And I will tell you that the, the, the Emporia State situation has exacerbated that to the extent that now that any time a program name is mentioned, somebody wonders if it's going to be shelved. And I don't mean it. So what I'm trying to do is ease the tension so people are more willing to address the issues. And I think if we can if we can let them know and bring them along, I think it's easier to do. So. Well, and I think this committee, as led by our chair, understands exactly what you just said. Yeah. So that's what we're trying to enable. And, I, and more than more than one of you have said at different times, I was in a meeting that we know we've got some programs we need to evaluate. So, so if we have alignment about that, then, then which I think we do, then then this is really about how we do that. Um, and, and so again, we can we can generate a list to give to you that's a couple of weeks early, but then it's still going to do exactly what you just described. And, and Regent Arts, I would only add that I really appreciate your, your pointing that out it's about how we do it. And honestly, I think it's even a little more nuanced about that because I think we've spent the last year talking about how we do it. I think and appreciate you asking the question. It's about how we communicate about how we do right, it. Exactly. Right. And that's and I so appreciate the conversation that we had and, and the recognition of um, the sensitivities to the people who are in those spaces and how we how we keep any angst that there is at the appropriate level that it needs to be and 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 when you do that right and i don't know that we have the answer on that but i really appreciate the partnership in that because my takeaway so far and back to knowing knowing early and, and laying that out so after this call all of our faculty understand, or after this meeting, all of our faculty understand that somewhere between October 1st and October 19th, we're going to kind of officially know who, what units we need to be talking to and make them aware of what's happening. And those conversations are best had in those units with those programs and, and give them some awareness. So, so the same respect that you're giving us, which we greatly appreciate some advance notice there. And we give advance notes in that unit to say, hey, this is coming, and this is where we think we are, and what are we going to do about it? And we have three options on that. We have an action, action plan, we have a merger, or we have a phase out. So let's talk about what are we going to do. It's that behind-the-scenes conversation and communication um, that then gets more public after we have those conversations in those groups, I think. So, so I do feel, and, and I can, again, only speak for myself and not all the provost, I do feel like we've spent a fair amount of months hashing out and being very clear about process and timeline and now it's exactly what programs come in front of us and how do we communicate with them in a way that that keeps the drama as low as possible because I can also emphasize with Howard um, students to pay attention, faculty pay attention, and other institutions, people ask when they're being um, recruited as students to KU, you know, how it impacts what's going on in the state campus faculty who are being recruited. So, so there's just a lot of politics around that that we find in the, 
me, it, it, I, I'm simplifying this. It's the personal piece. I, I want I want to tell Sam before Sam hears it from anybody else. I want her to know that I care about what's happening with this program. I don't want it to be black and white that this just happened and this is a decision and we think it's the right thing to do. She needs to know because we're educated. We come into this with dispositions that we care about people. And I would think that every parent in this state wants to know that when a child walks into a classroom, whether it's K-12 or higher ed, that we care. So to me, it's a, it's a little bit about the personal side of it. So. Yes. Thank you well, for that. Thank you, could... Regent Ice, for bringing it back in the room. Uh, this is probably one of the most important actions that we will be taking this year, right? All these other things are good too, but this is important. And um, one of the things that we need is to have folks that are impacted help us decide action plan merger phase out and be invested in trying to help us improve enrollment and um, recruitment into programs if an action plan is oriented. So it is about people and it is personal. And, and I hope you recognize we know that and we believe that too. That's what we're trying to we're trying to be responsive and help in that way. And while I'm talking, I mean if if we could dream of a perfect world, when we gave you the quote unquote list, you might even say, hey, you missed one. And add it right. So I mean, if we you know, right. so so I mean, so we should dream about the way we want it to be. We have uh, some recent history of learning from experiences with folks who've had to take this journey. Uh, a large university system to the east. I would hope that we would learn from lessons that we we can do better. So, thank you for bringing that up. Okay. Anything else that's that's up on our implementation list that you want to talk about or something to add on? Uh, Provost Bickelmeyer brought up something that we had noticed too with the English pathways not being clearly called out. But one of the things with that being clearly called out as system-wide, if you look at the math pathway timeline and then the placement standards, we have to think about placement standards not only for college algebra, but for whatever the new math classes are going to be. I said that, yeah. So that yeah. timeline doesn't look like it would be the same. I mean, it would seem like the standards, the course placement standards, unless we're going to have the math, all of the math identified by that time frame, is that the right time frame? I think it's a guesstimate right now. I mean, I think we get a group together and kind of start the conversations and see it's just a guesstimate right now. So the reason that I think we're a little bit concerned about it is as we communicate to our K-12 partners, we don't want to be dribbling out the communication. We want to have, you know, these are the new standards. These are the new cut scores. These are the new classes. It would just be a little easier for communication out. Right. There's a lot of, uh, this is just the tip of the iceberg yeah. showing you this and everything under it. So, and, and as Dr. Archer said, um, it's fluid. So he will be updating us as we, as we move forward. Okay, thank you for this conversation. Very helpful uh, and important that we work on this together. Um, Next on the agenda then is a, a kind of a reminder of the National Institute of S Student Success uh, playbooks. Uh, really wanted to be sure. Uh, it's uh, deliberately National Institute of Student Success playbooks today because I wanted to uh, make sure that all the, the folks that knew to bask yeah. were comfortable with that. Yeah. Moving forward, you will hear us own those as our student success playbooks. Region ICE. So today it is about what we learn from the National Institute and any questions about that and then moving forward and we're in ownership of that. So Dr. Archer. Good deal. Yeah, just to provide a little background on this, um, this stems out of Georgia State University and they've got a, just a tremendous success story. They were able to increase their graduation rate by about 23 percentage points in about a four or five year period and they were able to close equity gaps based on race, ethnicity and socioeconomic status. So uh, they've done some phenomenal work. And so back in 2021, uh, the board invited Georgia State President Mark Becker to present on kind of the Georgia success story. And I thought it was a great presentation, very important, board was very engaged, asked great questions, definitely one of the better outside presenters I think we've ever had come in. Um, the reason I, I provide that context is because when you look back, this was like January or February of 2021, of our current board membership, Regent John Roth was the only person who was a member at that point in time. So we had a lot of a changeover. There's a lot of background there. And so right around that same time, Georgia State University was launching uh, the National Institute for Student Success. Um, and essentially what this does is it's set up in a way that helps institutions. It 
pinpoint areas of, of potential improvement and then also to pinpoint best practices that will help facilitate improvement in those respective areas. And so we had our six state universities go through this as well as Cali College. Um, this is back in 21, fall 21, spring of 22. And um, obviously there were success playbooks for each uh, institution and some of those were unique, which was great, but there were also some recurring themes and just to kind of um, kind of summarize those, re-summarize those, one of the big pieces was um, related to academic advising. And I think one of the big things that Georgia State found is that they had operated under a decentralized system for the longest time where each college or school had their own advising and it was very separate. And I think what they found there, at least in their case, was that it would be really good in one college or school and it would be really bad in the other and there weren't really shared standards or expectations. And so there was a lot of inconsistency in the student experiences and retention levels reflected that. Um, and so they centralized advising and saw really great outcomes there. So um, I think they're very much an advocate for centralized advising and they noted some of the, um, the challenges that decentralized advising creates. Um, but they also recognize that not everyone can just flip a switch and go to a centralized model. Um, obviously, KU's done that. And Prof. Spickelmeyer has the, the scars to prove that. Um, it was a big lift there. But um, they, they, Georgia State also, again, recognizes that, that not everyone can just flip a switch on, on going to a centralized model. And so at the very least, they recommended that you have centralized training where you bring folks from different schools and departments together to create shared training documents and that people are cross-trained and people understand things uh, from more of a centralized perspective. And there are some shared core values and expectations that apply throughout the entire uh, university in terms of advising. So that was one big thing. Another big thing related to early alerts, and this is uh, really trying to identify those students who are struggling, of course, really early on in the semester, and then having someone reach out to them and prescribe an intervention and some kind of support mechanism. And uh, I think that one of the things they found was that there were certain colleges or departments within universities that were doing that well and others weren't. So I think they said to try to standardize that or make it a more consistent expectation. That was a big piece. And then obviously the other thing was degree maps, which are term by term schedules. We've talked about these before that outline this is what you take the first semester of your freshman year. This is what you take the second semester of your freshman year. And it really outlines the sequences um, of what you take. And um, some of our programs are very sequential. And if you miss a course, it can really throw off your graduation. Um, and so that's something obviously we're going to be doing through the performance agreements and funding, which I think is going to be a good step for us going forward. But those were some of the bigger things. But last spring, you may remember when we were at Pittsburgh. Um, and then I think at the subsequent meeting, when we were back here, in May, I believe we had the universities present on the work that had been done. I thought those were great presentations. I thought good progress had been made. Um, obviously that work continues, it's a process. Um, and I know again, some good work has even occurred since those presentations. So I think it would be great if we could have the provost or maybe one of their student affairs, VPs, whoever's responsible for this, if we could have each one of them present, maybe one in November and one in December and so forth on just updates on things that have gone on. I know uh, talking to Provost Bickelmeyer, I know they've done some really good work with meta majors as an example. So I think just providing updates on the good work that's been done, I think would be really beneficial for us this year. So I'm hoping we can um, integrate that into the scheduling. Do you all think that'd be doable? It's really important work. So thank you for reminding us of the history. And as we move forward, there are connections to our dashboard and the things we want to monitor and things that we should, we should be talking about. Uh, on a regular basis for, for student success. And in our unified budget request, you're gonna, you have seen or you will see um, an item for uh, requesting funding for navigators. The navigators in essence will be extending into the high school's professional advice. So very supportive uh, of that. Thankful to Heather and the community college team for also supporting that because the more we can help surround our students and their families with access and information, the more success we'll have. So Regent Johnston, I think, um, wanted to create some space for you in, in, on this topic to make sure that um, you're comfortable with where we are, how we got here, and, and how to move forward on the student success playbook. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I am. I think that the student success playbook, I had an opportunity to visit with uh, some of those folks. 
uh, through a Zoom meeting. I think that there's certainly a lot of value. I do think that it can be tailored to individual college or university needs as well as schools and programs. Uh, but it, it certainly looks like it can be very valuable. And like Daniel said, I mean, just sort of uh, centralizing things, uh, of course, can help sometimes breaking down those barriers. So it'll be interesting to see uh, as we move forward how KU's doing. And, and like Daniel said, it will be very interesting to see what progress has already been made or if progress has been made. So I'm interested in that for sure. Thank you very much. So we'll look at the schedule and find a way to have some updates and also be thinking of that's the kind of conversation I'm hoping we have with the support metrics and your regular reports so, as we move forward. Comments? I, um, I'd like to uplift that um, we're now in year two of our individual university playbooks. I think it's really critical to point out that as part of the system ask, um, I think there's also resources for student success which dovetail into these playbooks. Yeah. That's critical for the institutions. Moving to these models, um, adopting at least a four Hayes EAB Navigate is a significant expense. Uh, it's worth it, but is it a significant financial outlay for the institution? Um, and so I hope that the board will continue to support that part of the system ask. Um, as it goes forward to the legislature this fall or this spring. Regent Lane. Yes. Oh, I just want to say I really appreciate that because that is one thing that worries me, especially as we would like to also see this implemented at the community college and technical college level. And that is the lack of resources sometimes to be able to implement, of course, these types of programs. And so I greatly appreciate the fact that we really do need to support the idea of how are we going to financially make sure that that is something that we can do across the system? And I think that that will be very valuable. Our budget should reflect our priorities, right? So great yes. comment. Thank you for uh, the, the update, uh, Dr. Archer, and we appreciate your, your reports and keeping us abreast of how we're doing on all of these important projects. Before we go to the suggested agenda item. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry, Provost Bickelmeyer, go ahead. Just, just one thing for clarification or, or future, but I, based on Bill's comment, I can't resist to, to add to the point and appreciate um, Regent Johnson, your understanding and, and your uh, comments, Regent Lane. I, I do wanna say as a provost, and while it was some incredibly hard work and incredibly challenging work, um, it absolutely was a great thing to do for students at the University of Kansas. Um, it was a massively heavy lift, and there was a lot to be in back to politics and drama in that space that that, um, that had to go behind that. But I also do want to note that there are so many levels of benefit depending on where you go with that. And to Daniel's point, that had to do with um, readjusting uh, workloads for advisors across, you know, so some advisors who had too many students got the right amount of students. It created career tracks for advisors. It created, um, it took care of lack of competition or a competition between units that could pay advisors more and those that paid advisors less. But I do want to say, and I won't have my accounting exactly right on this, um, but I can get you exact numbers on this. It cost KU about between five and six million dollars in that and appreciate all the support we got for that. But I'll also say that almost immediately without accounting for any other change, we saw increase in um, fall to spring retention and we saw increase in freshman to sophomore retention on that, particularly for typically underserved minorities. So it was very well worth it um, in every area, but, it, but there's a lot of challenge with the fact that we already have challenged budgets and we have to shift dollars to cover things. So um, that, that was maybe one of the more difficult journeys in, in three and a half years at KU. At um, so I so <coughs> couldn't reiterate enough to work on that. The other thing tied to the front side and appreciate your understanding of the value of navigators as well, because we've been moving in that direction, uh, uh, campus wide or university wide as well. Um, one of the most important things around navigators, 
I would hope that we would address is to determine, to define the role and scope. Because navigators get into recruitment and orientation and then how far beyond, and it butts right up against what is advising. So knowing exactly what we mean by navigators has a long downstream effect to that. So it'd be really helpful to frame it exactly what, what you might be looking for there. Thank you for those comments. All right, anything else? Before we look at our agenda items um, to our student leaders who are here, I would welcome hearing what's one takeaway from today's conversation for you. So be thinking about that. We'll talk about our agenda items and then we'll come back to let you close out the meeting with your key takeaways. So uh, suggested agenda items will have additional performance reports uh, at our October 3rd virtual meeting uh, and, uh, we, and potential new program approvals. Is, is that correct? Um, I have taken some notes on uh, future agenda items around the support metrics and projected launch date. Regent Mendoza, uh, would you like to do an update on the apprenticeship program, uh, teacher apprenticeship program? And then uh, I added a note on the uh, student success playbooks and getting those back in front of us so we can celebrate and encourage uh, your work in that arena. Is, are there other items that we need to tee up for Jim? Okay, uh, hearing none, thank you for that. Now we'll go back to our student leaders. Why are you still on schedule, Madam Chair? Um, why are you still on top of the schedule? schedule. I'm, I don't want to accidentally have an unexcused absence. <laughs> you recall October 3rd is one of the ones I had an extending conflict. Yes. Yes. So when y'all don't see me, it wasn't because I didn't think the first time I was here went badly. <laughs> Thank you. Very good. Thank you for that. All right. Take away. So I'd say personally, my biggest takeaway from today, especially it was a lot of it was with the program reviews and hearing about that. Um, obviously, um, departments, anytime that they hear that word, it is something that's very daunting to each and every single one of them. Um, I'm personally a part of a program that typically is under that light. Um, just so it is, it is a challenging thing. Um, part of the reason why I, I'm a transfer student, I transferred to Pittsburgh State University was because um, the college that I was at went through similar things to Emporia State University. And then from there, that's why I made the decision to transfer because our the program there had been cut so much to where like it wasn't sustainable for me to continue there. Um, so that's one of the things is that like I worry sometimes with our programs that are at the colleges um, is that sometimes they don't have as high of numbers, but they still have a lot of value. Um, and so definitely making sure that we can still recognize that. Um, and just thinking too of like, I had a friend at another institution where his program, it got cut while he was there. And so, but they still had a plan in place for the people who were still in that program to complete it. And then it was going to be phased out. Um, so I don't know if that's something that we can also consider where if a program is going to get phased out to where students are still allowed to complete it, they're still in it. So they don't have to go through the transferring process. Um, but I'd say those were kind of my like biggest takeaways from today. Well said, and yes, there is. Uh, that's what the phase out plan is, is all about. So thank you for that. And I'm glad you're in Kansas now. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Um, I think my biggest takeaway has to tie into the connection between the different nursing programs ac across the state. I really love what we've done with elementary ed and transferring that to nursing is phenomenal. And, you know, extending that to other programs would be, I think, a really great step for the state of Kansas. Um, if I could make a recommendation that I think could be a little bit interesting while we focus on that would be selfishly as someone who wants to go to medical school and wants to be in the state of Kansas, if we could look at biology pre-medicine programs and our pre-vet programs as they tie into our state schools. So, you know, making sure that all of our pathways align with the KU School of Medicine and what they're doing um, and kind of promoting exactly what their classes are, especially for those first and second years of medical school, you know, making sure that students uh, have access to classes like immunology, virology, because they are so important in those first two, two years at KU Med. 
So as you consider those transitions, maybe consider the same ones for graduate programs and professional schools. I think that could be really useful for our students, especially in retaining them in Kansas as highly educated people, because that's obviously all of our goal here in higher education, right? Keep these amazing students here. And I think that could be a really great pathway to consider moving forward as we work on a similar project from the community college level. Thank you for that. Well said. Ella. I would say that um, I was really intrigued by the math pathways, actually, because I am a political science major, like you specifically noted. Okay. Um, and I took both college algebra and statistics. And I know for me, it would have been huge to take just statistics and then kind of get right into my other coursework within um, my degree program. I did take both college algebra and stats through Seward County Community College while I was in high school. And so I think it would be really cool if we could consider um, informing the high schools and their counselors through that navigator program about the math pathways to make sure that the right students are taking the right gen ed classes at the high school level so that when you get right in, you're only taking the classes that you need. Because um, it would have been huge for me and other students within my degree program to only take statistics instead of both college algebra and statistics. Thanks to all three of you. You're making this work real and relevant. So I appreciate that very much. All right, is there any other business to come before us today? Hearing none, accept a motion to adjourn. So moved. Nice meeting you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Regina. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.